the House of Lords EU Select Committee has just issued a report on the European Social Fund in the UK. The chair of the inquiry, which has called witnesses and visited projects, was Lady Howarth. Valerie Howarth is a social scientist. Uh, she's a former social worker. She's a former director of social services. And she's a former chief executive of Childline. Valerie Howarth, as part of the, um, this investigation, you got to visit between you on the committee quite a number of, uh, of projects. Um, those quite often are the things that leave people with the strongest impression, aren't they? What did you take from visiting the projects? Well, because of my work, I visited a lot of projects. But this was really quite special. Uh, and I think it was because there were so many different people from different walks of life uh, who otherwise would have not had the opportunity. There was uh, a woman, uh, a black woman, who'd come over to this country, had, had very little work, um, and who was being taken on a cl as a cleaner and being trained to do the job. There was another woman who had moved from that, was sitting in front of a computer learning how to do computer skills. I went into a room with a group of men who were learning how to manage their feelings and their anger so that their anger management would enable them to work with other people. People were learning to fill in forms in the most grotty building, I have to say, uh, but wonderful work. And that's what leaves you with the real impression. These are real people uh, getting real help and from Europe. And not necessarily, of course, being moved straight into jobs, although I guess some of them may have been, but certainly being moved closer to jobs. That's a real issue. Um, there is a discussion about what are called soft and hard options. Uh, I think it's a misnomer because helping people who've been addicted to drugs or on alcohol uh, who have been out of work for a long time, or having to switch from having been probably quite competent to getting a certificate for a job they think they can do with all that takes in terms of emotional impact. All those things are difficult. And that's what these, uh, this work was about. Uh, and the government, I think, feel that we should count people who get into jobs. It was certainly the committee's feeling that you had to count people getting their steps towards jobs because in some ways that's much more difficult. If you've got two people who have to go for one job, they may both have got along the road, but there's only one job, there's only one tick in the box. But you did see those steps being taken? Before our very yeah. eyes. Excellent. I think we all realise that this social fund was actually invented for one economy, and now after the, the credit crunch we find ourselves in a completely different one. How do you feel it's operated? Has it been sufficiently flexible to cope with that, those massive changes? We were very impressed by that. Um, it seemed that um, projects had been able to move into different areas of work. Now, there were some difficulties about that. Um, where the hardest to reach might have been pushed out a little because people who were easier to place were higher up the job need. So we were saying very strongly, don't take the focus off the hardest to reach, but sometimes that flexibility is very useful. And we saw projects uh, like the one in Cornwall, where they were working with young graduates who would find mm. great difficulty in getting jobs, and they placed hundreds of young people and got them into work and kept them in Cornwall, which was the very positive uh, thing. So I think the flexibility was demonstrated. And what you're saying there, of course, is also quite an important point about the ability to plan regionally rather than just nationally. <laughs> that was a very important uh, point. Um, there was a, a lot of criticism about sometimes central direction uh, driving out local initiative. And it was where people were working locally where you could see the biggest impact. And there was a large cry from a lot of the groups that we saw before us, to make that regional work uh, more positive. The organisations that play the largest, largest part in getting to the hardest to reach potential beneficiaries are often the smallest ones, and they find it the most difficult, I think, to come to terms with the complexities of major funding uh, structures like this. How did you feel they coped and the system coped with them? Let me start in a different place. I think that... Uh, the government, the DWP, acting for the government, the regional funds, ERDF funds, separate funds, 
and the uh, European Social Fund uh, coming together have real impact. And I think that was felt by a number of our witnesses. The problem is they all have different bureaucracies. And those bureaucracies are impossible to manage if you're a small organisation. What's been done to overcome that is for the regional groups set up by the department uh, to oversee the groupings. Consequently, the very smallest groups have disappeared out of the pot. They simply cannot keep up with the complexity of the paperwork and some of the ways of funding. One of the ways of funding is to make sure you get your money when somebody gets into a job. If you're a small organisation, you haven't got a hope of underpinning the funding until that point. And yet it's some of the very smallest organisations who are the specialists in helping people who've been on alcohol or drug addicted or long-term out of work to actually get into work. So I think there is a real conflict in all of that. Can I just pick you up on a point that that I think you've you've just made, which is that, and and it's one of the things that actually jumps out of the report to somebody like me reading it, is that there is a real tension between those um, who are, between using the fund to help the hardest to reach, which is often, I think, code for the poorest people and those with the greatest handicaps, and actually try to use it to generate new activity in the economy, which may mean actually working with people much closer to to jobs and people with rather higher qualifications. How did the committee see that tension working out? Well, I suppose we had a rather complex answer to that and a simple solution at the end. The complex bit was that... um, You can't just give one answer in one place at any point in time. You have to take into account where any bit of the um, country is in terms of the employability and employment of its population. So again, Cornwall was somewhat different from the north of England. Uh, And that flexibility, as I said earlier, has been useful in terms of coping with the recession. But the committee was absolutely adamant that in all of that the danger of driving out the services to the hardest to reach was a real uh, and and ever-present danger. And the committee's strong recommendation is that that group should not be lost in any changes. But do you foresee more attention in the future maybe being given by the fund to people who are, say, closer to work, um, easier to get the hard outcomes out of, the, 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 the success statistics, and therefore rather better qualified? Well, look, if I'm running a project and I'm going to get paid by getting people into work um, rather than helping some really difficult people along the steps of the road towards work, it's going to be a great temptation to meet those targets and get the cash. And I think that's the danger. Yeah. I, I, was, I was very interested, uh, pursuing this line a, a little bit longer, I was very interested in the report to see that you made some comments about, I think, what you regard as the weakness of the current evaluation, at least of some of the, the fund, and, and really the difficulty of getting reliable evaluation of these so-called soft outcomes, maybe the intermediate outcomes of people doing things differently differently presenting themselves differently. Um, How important is all of that to you? I think that's utterly crucial. Um, And I say that because uh, you might get a tick in the box that says someone has uh, got a job, but we don't actually measure how long they're going to be in the job, whether they are successful, uh, whether their behaviour in that community or with their family is any different from the experience that they've had in the project. The value of what are called soft options is that it often changes people's behaviour in the round. So they not only get a job, but they, if you like, are better citizens. I've worked in a number of areas, and we had some evidence from some witnesses showing how you can measure those what are called soft options. You you can see how people change their behaviour. You can see whether they become more consistent in attendance. Um, you can measure how they engage in discussion about 
uh, their own anger, feelings, approach to other, uh, other fellow employees. All those things are possible, uh, but we didn't see very much um, encouragement, if you like, from Europe or from central government in developing those, those options. So you felt there was a, a genuine barrier there to making progress? Well, the target is to get a tick in the box because you've mm. got in a job. Mm. And we pointed out on a number of occasions that if two people do reasonably well, but there's only one job, only one person gets the tick, but mm. the other person might well have done very well. Uh, and it's this pull-push, as one of our committee members called it, and that is the other bit is there has to be enough jobs. So we have to be working to produce the employment uh, as well as those being employable. One of the interesting issues that, that, that come from what you've just said, um, and I don't know whether actually as a committee you looked at it at all, is that quite often people suggest that these things like the European Social Fund, people get um, actually amounts of money which they're not which, which are quite large by their standards. They, co- they conduct projects, the projects finish, and then very often there isn't seen to be um, a link, a continuity between that project, the people on the project, and the other services to which those beneficiaries um, ought to be exposed, that they ought to be able to benefit from. Did you, did you f- see in what you looked at a, a continuity between the European Social Fund projects and the other services that would follow on after and pick up some of those, what you might call those soft outcomes, those, those intermediate benefits? Well, we were, we were very concerned about some of that, and particularly the differences between the European um, Development Fund and the European the Social regional fund. fund. The Regional yes, Fund. Yeah, yeah. The Regional Fund. Um, and some of the local projects. And there is a plethora, a complexity of projects out there, which is what makes it more difficult, I think, for organisations in applying. And I think coordination could be much better. Uh, And certainly, um, if the projects end, there is great concern about what might or might not be in their place. One of the benefits of of producing a report like yours at this point um, in a funding programme i.e. halfway through, is that you do stand some chance of influencing the way that people operate, maybe improve what they do in the second half of the programme. Have you got messages for the government, for the commission, for the project promoters, maybe even for the beneficiaries themselves, um, as to what they might do to make the second half of this funding year ESF round uh, from 2010 to 2013 better even than than what you've seen so far? Keep it simple. Keep it local. Keep it focused on the right beneficiaries. And I think the other bit about it is to ensure that those people who are are benefiting from the fund know that it's Europe that's helping them. Because we do have a tendency in this country to think that Europe is something out there when actually it's the project on your doorstep. And although there was some discussion about publicity, I think we found people who were grateful for the help, but very unclear about where it came from. Did you feel that people were genuinely producing projects which were unlikely to have got funded from other sources for the social fund? Absolutely. Uh, These were the... um, Because many of the projects had other funding for other parts of their project. Um, And these margins were the difficult bits that they would not otherwise ever have. And I think, uh, as you know, our great fear is that at the end of the uh, funding, uh, the British government will say we're no longer one of the the countries that should be funded, um, that the poorer countries of Europe should receive European social funding, Uh, One of the things the committee heard very clearly was that right across Europe, rather than looking at it horizontally, vertically, there are pockets of poverty and need in every single country, including this one. And it may not be that we have such a huge grant, but that we should have some funding to meet those needs. And I think there's another very important issue, and that is it demonstrates European citizenship. 
because we can help people across Europe to share information and knowledge and understanding about how you work in these very difficult areas. And what's more, we could learn from them. So you're saying that from 2014 to 2020, which seems a long way ahead now, but nevertheless is how, when the next social fund will be planned for, there should still be a positive role for it in the UK. Absolutely, and it's closer than you think. Valerie Howe, thank you very much indeed.